Well, good morning, everyone. And a warm welcome to Burghead uh, Free Church. My name's Paul. I'll be leading us through the sermon, uh, sermon the service, and the sermon this morning. And uh, our minister, Peter, will step up here uh, right towards the end, just after the sermon, with some important stuff to share with you. Uh, so do hang around for that when it all seems to be over. It's just a little bit more. Peter will be here to do that. Um, uh, maybe you're new to us this morning, um, if that's so. Uh, maybe you're visiting on holiday. Um, maybe you've come along just to try us out, uh, to see what really goes on inside these, these walls here. Well, whatever your reason for being here, we're glad that God has prompted you uh, to be with us. Uh, someone close by will direct you to a welcome pack, if that's useful to you. Um, you'll find some helpful information, tell you about what it is that we believe. And do stay around at the end of the service and enjoy some refreshments and uh, a good chat so we can get to know you better. And of course, at the same time, you'll be getting to know us better. Up to that point, you've got a service sheet, I hope, that you got as you came in, and that will steer us through everything this morning. Do take it with you as well and use the notes on the back uh, to guide some of your prayers this week. Now, of course, our um, primary purpose this morning is uh, to come together to come before a great God and uh, to submit our lives together under God's word and his son. As we remember, we recommit, and we're sent out in the world to reach the world. Our call to worship echoes that intent. It comes from our study passage this morning, Psalm 57. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So the psalmist says, I will sing of you among the peoples. And that's what we're going to do right now. And we normally talk of tuning our voices or tuning our instruments. But I love it, uh, the opening line of this song, which calls us to tune our hearts to sing his grace. So don't worry too much about your voice. Let your heart be shaped as we stand now, if you're able to sing, come thou fount of every blessing. Well, as you look around, you'll see we don't actually have any uh, children of an age that I think I can do the catechism with. Um, I, we've got, a, well, we've got Ava there, and um, 
I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to do something different anyway because I only learned I was doing the catechism about half an hour ago. And uh, I prepared something else on holiday this week. Um, we were down in uh, southwest France and uh, early in the morning each day I'd get up and go bird watching. Won't be a surprise to lots of you. And um, one of the birds I saw was this one. This one, hopefully. If it doesn't come up, it doesn't matter. Oh, there we go. And some of you will know what that is. Shout it out if you do. Osprey. That's it. That's an osprey. And uh, I was in a lovely place um, uh, called uh, De Tancuso, which was like this big uh, wet place. And there were ospreys there feeding, and I was watching them. It was great. And um, I, I've got a fish in my box. Um, the, the props department... Of course, the osprey is a fish-eating sort of eagle. The props department were a bit thin today. So this is my fish. Uh, it was the best I could do. Now, the, the osprey swoops down and grabs the fish like that. Okay, you can imagine, can't you? It comes down, and there's the fish swimming that way, and it grabs it like that. But it has these amazing talons that can dislocate. And, uh, and so as it's flying away, if it's flying like that, it's flying into the wind, and that big, fat fish is, uh, is kind of... You know, it's not very, what's the word, streamlined. It's not very streamlined. And so the osprey has these talons that can dislocate themselves so that as it flies, it carries a fish like that. Let's try the next picture. And there it is. I think that's a carp it's carried. And uh, it can fly with the fish uh, streamlined into the air, which I always think is brilliant. I love that. Um, now... I could tell you all sorts of stuff about an osprey, uh, but I'm only going to tell you one more thing, um, or oh, two more things. One is that we have ospreys here in Scotland, don't we? You'll see them in Lossie, you'll see them in Findhorn, and it's great to see. Everybody gets excited, oh, there's an osprey, and we, we watch it, and we watch it dive, and it's great. But actually, they only spend a short part of their time here. Uh, for the most of their lives, they go back to Africa, 3,000 miles to Senegal or the Gambia, that sort of um, western part of, um, of Africa. Now, um, I, I could go into the reasons why they do that. If you want to know, ask me afterwards. I, I'll gladly spend ages telling you why they, why they do all that. Um, but the thing is, they do it, and it's remarkable. How do they know where to go? And it's even more remarkable that in some countries, they've lost their ospreys. Um, Farmers have poisoned them, people have shot them. And so there's this big program to reintroduce ospreys into places where they've gone missing. And uh, one of the places is Ireland, Portugal's another, Spain. And um, they do it in all sorts of ways. But one of the ways they do it is called translocation. That's where this box comes in. Okay? Translocation is where they go to nests in Scotland or Finland and Sweden, where there's quite a lot of ospreys. And uh, ospreys will lay two or three eggs, and they will take an egg from lots of different nests, and they will take, it, take those eggs to the country where they want the ospreys to come back. This is my osprey. It was the best I could do. And Douglas, no, you're not having this one. All right? You can't have him. Sue would never forgive me. Uh, that's my egg. I told you the props department was struggling. Um, come to that in a minute. So they have these boxes. They're called um, hacking boxes. And they're up high in a tree, okay? Or on a platform, actually, not so much in a tree. And there are lots of them all in a line. You'll see one. Oh, you see one no, already. I didn't want you to see that yet, but never mind. Uh, that's what they really look like. I was quite impressed with my visual aid here. Um, and they take the eggs and they put them in. In. Right there. And they keep them warm. And uh, eventually, um, the ospreys will hatch. And they come out little ospreys, like this. And uh, I'm not going to make any osprey noises. Stop laughing. It's not comedy. This is, this is the word coming up in a minute. And um, so the osprey uh, hatches. And through the back, there's not a hole in here. I didn't have time to make one. They have um, a sort of curtain. And they're fed with fish through the back so that they never see the person feeding them. Okay? And... Uh, they, they eat this fish, and eventually they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're ready to fledge. And so what they do, if I stand back here a little bit, they put fish 
on a platform just away. Actually, in that picture, they're hanging them on string. Can you see at the bottom? They've got a fish hanging on a string, several of them. And the ospreys, they look around. Where's, you know, the dinner's not coming through the back anymore. Where can I go? And they see it, and they fly over, and they feed on it. Now, this is the amazing thing. I can put all that away. When those ospreys are fully fledged and they are ready to fly, the end of the summer comes. Bear in mind they've never seen a parent bird. They've hatched from an egg in a place that they've never been to. Their parents have never been to. They hatch out. They go off fishing for a bit. They build up their strength. And then around about mid-August, guess what they do? They fly 3,000 miles to the exact place where their parents live the rest of their lives. Now, how does that happen? How do they know where to go? What is it that gets them to Senegal, say, from Ireland? How on earth do they do that? Can we have the next? So while I was watching this, next slide. While I was watching this, this is the verse that kept coming into my head again and again and again. I wasn't watching them flying 3,000 miles, by the way, but I was just watching the ospreys. God has made everything beautiful in its time. I mean, that's true, isn't it? God has made so many beautiful things. I'm going to miss the middle bit for a moment and go to the end. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. No one knows how these ospreys can do that. We haven't got a, well, we've got some clues, we've got some ideas, and people talk about magnetic things going on in the osprey's brains, but nobody really understands it. Only God understands it. And then go to that middle bit, because just as God has put that understanding into the osprey, so he has also set eternity in the human heart. Um, I want to uh, read this to you, because I wrote it, and I want... He's put that into all of us, a sense that this world is not all that there is, that there's more beyond what we see, both in the past and in the present, and it lasts forever. He has set eternity into the human heart. I sat there on this big platform watching an osprey, and that was the sort of thing going through my mind, Um, my refuge, if you like. We'll come to more of that later. So I think the children are going to go to, um, is that right, or are you staying in? She's going. Okay, we're, they're off. So I'm just going to pray for Ava um, as she... They're not off, they're staying. Okay. Um, I'll still pray for them, because uh, it's important. Let's pray just for these, uh, these small children. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beauty of your creation. It's beauty that points us to you. All we need to do is open our hearts to understand your goodness and to see your majesty. So this morning, help us do just that, whether we're children of three, two, or 72, 73, as we we listen and open our hearts to what you have to say. Amen. Well, Paul is uh, uh, going to come out to continue for us in prayer. Thank you, Paul. Everlasting, eternal, almighty God, hear our prayers which we offer in his name and by the power of the Holy Spirit working among us. As we gather together in worship of our gracious and holy Father, let us take time to reflect on how we have served him this week. Jesus has charged us as his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Lord, we pray for all gathered here today to carry this through into their daily lives. During the summer break from our small group meetings, help us, Father, to fill this void with a hunger to learn more from your holy book and to make us more aware than ever on how to apply our knowledge of Jesus into our very being. May those on trips, visits to see friends and family and having a summer holiday be refreshed and restored and see the beauty of your creation and look upon it with awe and wonder. 
We pray for our church leadership, both in Burkhead and Elgin, for Peter and Brian, that your Holy Spirit will guide and protect them, plant in their hearts that passionate desire to stick close to the message that you would give to inspire your people in our community. We are so grateful for the freedom to have the local children come and learn of you and continue to ask that you give us the openness to work among schools in Elgin and Burkhead. We pray that those young ones who came along to the Elgin Summer Club will keep close to you and bring their parents along to hear more. Thank you for giving us a willing team who worked in unity to make this happen. Bless and protect them. Let the fruit of their labor be apparent. We give you thanks for the many ways the Dupola family have given devoted service to you in the years they have been with us. And we pray that Davy, Emma, Benjamin, and the new baby will be assured that, they, that you are with them every step of the way for their move into their new roles at the Smithton Church. We pray for their adjustments to family life and a smooth transition into their new home. We pray also for Paul and Sue on their move to Australia and ask that their journey is a smooth one. Hold them safe in your tender arms. We give thanks that the final, final hurdles in our quest to refurbish and build the new church halls are close and ask for guidance in choosing a contractor. Lord, we pray for the less fortunate in our community that you provide for their needs. Let us be more aware of where to help and be active in seeking out those who need spiritual, physical, and mental help. Give us the tools and knowledge to bring that help wherever it is needed. We pray for those with spiritual gifts within our own church family that you would encourage them to let each of us identify what is required within our fellowship. Sustain us in all things to help build your kingdom. Heavenly Father, we pray for our newly elected Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, and the government as they take political control of our country. We ask you, Lord, to bless our national representatives with wisdom and integrity and to restrain evil. We also pray for John Swinney, John Swinney, Scotland's First Minister, that he would live and work for good as he carries out his duties in public office. We pray for our fellow believers who work in politics, that you will give them knowledge to perform these duties in a godly way. We pray for all the nations throughout the world who are living with conflict. In these desperate times, give strength to those who work for peace and protect and comfort those in danger. We pray for persecuted Christians that they will receive strength to sustain them in their witness and let those who persecute them be in awe and wonder of how our Lord Jesus sustains them through all their trials and tribulations. Finally, Lord, we ask your blessing follows each person here today and let us return your blessings with adoring praise. All this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, well, we're going to sing again. Emma's going to lead us, uh, I believe. Keith's getting ready to stand up, so Emma's probably not going to lead us at this point. Um, but we're singing Psalm 145, and uh, it's, I will exalt you, O my God and King forever. I will praise your holy name. When we finish singing, um, Gillian will come out, and she's going to read God's word to us.
This morning's reading is on page 576 in the Church Bibles. <clears throat> For the director of music, to the tune of Do Not Destroy of David and Mictan, when he fled from Saul into the cave. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me, who sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love, reaching the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. This is the Lord's word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gillian. Those regulars here will know that Peter's always saying, this is my favorite psalm. I think the thing is that... Uh, when you read a psalm, there's something about the way it's written that just really strikes home, and whichever psalm you happen to read at any particular time becomes your favorite for a while. I think that's what's going on. Um, the lovely words, we're actually going to sing them before I, I come to talk through the words. Um, so uh, if you're able, do stand. We're going to sing, My Heart is Steadfast, Lord, with music I will sing. It is um, Psalm 57, and this time Emma is going to lead us. Thanks, Emma. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Well, where do you run to for refuge in times of trouble when your wisdom and strength are exhausted, when you need rest and comfort, when you need peace? Maybe you run to other people 
um, close friends, relatives, those you can trust. Uh, trust them for wisdom and guidance. Or perhaps it's pleasures that you seek out. You know, something to take your mind off the problems, if only for a while. Or maybe you run to a substance, something, anything to turn off the pain. But in the cold light of day, we know, don't we, that actually none of these things can give us the security that we need. They may provide temporary distraction, uh, simple respite and relief, but not safety, not security, not refuge. None of these things will save us from disaster. And if we do turn to these things, if that's where we place our hope, uh, well, pretty soon we're going to be adding deep disappointment to the troubles we already face. Well, David, our psalmist, he knows there's only one place to run to for protection, for true rest, true security. He says, you and I must make the Lord our refuge. But look, right from the beginning, let me say this, trusting in God does not mean in times of trouble we simply close our eyes and pray. We need to take sensible action too. You know, back in uh, 2019, we were visiting our son Christopher's um, in-laws, Gary and Cindy, in Arkansas. Now, Arkansas is an area of the States. It has its fair share of tornadoes. Um, and consequently, most homes have a, a tornado shelter. And one late evening, we were with them enjoying a meal when the siren sounded, the warning siren for tornadoes. Uh, we would have been really foolish to just say a quick prayer and tuck into our burritos. Now, we took prompt action. Uh, we went down to their sub-basement shelter for protection. It's a cold concrete cube, all gray, a little airless and damp because it's underground, and no windows, of course, lit only by a couple of hand torches, and not really big enough for the eight souls who crammed in there that evening. It's the closest I've come to hiding in a cave. I remember Gary prayed for safety uh, as we huddled together. I don't remember the words he chose specifically, but they would have been along the lines of David's opening prayer. Have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on us. That's a prayer most of us will probably have prayed at some time or another maybe in times of distress, or perhaps when we've been especially conscious of our rebellion against God. And in our heightened sense of fear or shame or failure, we cry out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. At those times when we face desperate situations, when our own resources are all used up and we throw ourselves on God's mercy. Well, here in Psalm 57, David is in that desperate need. He's on the run. King Saul is after him and wants him dead. And David has taken action. He's run as far from Saul as he can get. He's hiding in a cave, in a desert. He tries to protect himself. But he knows that ultimately only the Lord God can save him. Now, the background story is complex. Uh, we can read the history in 1 Samuel. David is the focus of a nationwide manhunt. And he must have been desperately scared because he seems to be running towards more danger. Uh, the first place he ran to was the city of Gath. That was a Philistine city. Now, dangerous enough in itself, the Philistines, of course, were deadly enemies to Israel. But to make things worse... David went there carrying the only sword that he could lay his hands on. It was the sword that had belonged to the Philistine champion Goliath. And Goliath was from the city of Gath. And David, of course, was the one who chopped his head off with that very sword. So you'd think Gath would be the last place he'd go to, to seek refuge. But he reckoned even that was safer than staying in Israel. To protect himself before the king of Gath, Ashish, 
He pretends to be insane. You can read about it in 1 Samuel 21. While he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. And his pretense brings him temporary relief because Ashish can't be bothered with him. But Psalm 56 records the terror he still felt in Gath. Do you remember? All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire. They lurk. They watch my steps, hoping to take my life. And so it wasn't long before he fled once more. And in our psalm this morning, he's left Gath, and he's now hiding in the cave of Adulam. Saul and his soldiers are still searching for him, and they're armed to the teeth. Verse 4. Men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. They're baying for blood, like ravenous beasts, David says. No amount of peace talks will save him if he's found. And he's hiding in this cave, in a dark place. And you'd expect him to be full of dark thoughts, maybe full of self-pity, focusing on his plight and the injustice of it all. Why me? But the wonderful thing about this psalm, sung in the physical and metaphorical darkness, David's thoughts are actually full of God. Okay, he begins, as we might expect, with a plea we ourselves would almost certainly make, have mercy on me, have mercy. He's asking, be my refuge, Lord. But then remarkably, he goes on to pray in a manner that's full of confidence, full of hope, full of joy, full of God with the wonderful refrain in verses 5 and 11. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. These are words repeated like a chorus of a song. Now look, we're in the middle of the European Championships, aren't we? So you've got to forgive me at least one football analogy, especially this morning, by the way. Um, We're looking here at a psalm of two halves. It's not much of a football analogy. It was the best I could do. The first half is all about God, my strength and refuge. And the second half is about God, my song. And those are the two headings I've chosen to help us work through the psalm. So let's kick off with God, my strength and refuge. Look again at verse 1. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. And notice straight away where his confidence lies. It's not in the walls of the cave that give David refuge. It's in the arms of his Lord. When he looks into the darkness surrounding him, he doesn't see blackness, not cold gray rock. He sees the outspread wings of God himself. It's a repeated image in this series of Psalms, um, this beautiful picture of the shadow of God's wings. And whether in your mind's eye you see a mother hen gathering her chicks under her wings, or, or you see the wings of a powerful eagle hovering over its eerie and its young, either way, it's a picture of absolute security. David taking refuge under the shadow of God's wings. And please don't miss the end of verse 1 there. Did you notice it? Until the disaster has passed. David has absolute confidence that his present troubles will pass, that God will bring him through to a bright new day. And it's in that security, it's in that confidence, verse 2, He cries out to God in prayer, remembering who God is. He's the Most High. And it doesn't matter how overwhelming the threat against David is. He understands that although it's too big for him to prevail against alone, his God, he remembers, is God Most High. He's the God, verse 2, who vindicates me. The God who will bring this disaster to an end for me fulfilling his purpose in me. David understands with deep conviction that in all things, this is the God who works for good of those who love him. This God 
is not going to abandon him in this cave. Because also, verse 3, he's the God who saves. He sends from heaven and saves me. And what does he send forth from heaven? We might expect an image of strength and almighty power to crush David's enemies. Well, on the one hand, no. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. But on the other hand, yes, because love is his strength. Love is his almighty power. His covenant love and his covenant faithfulness. This is the God David takes refuge in, the God most high, the God of love and faithfulness who saves, who fulfills and keeps his promise, keeps his purposes. And because of that, David rests. With God as my refuge, David says, I lie down among the ravenous beasts. He sleeps resting in the shadow of the Almighty. Not resting away from trouble, but resting in the midst of trouble as he takes refuge in God. Recalling maybe uh, David's most famous psalm, well, uh, most well-known psalm, I perhaps should say, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This is the God David has worshipped since being a shepherd boy on the hills above Bethlehem, the God who preserved him against lions and bear, a bear, the God he trusted in when he faced the giant Goliath. He has a lifetime of blessings in our Lord through good times and bad, so he has every confidence now that God will preserve him. God, my refuge. And our second heading, God, my song. Here in verse 5 is David's refrain, repeated in verse 11, because it's important. It's the main concern of David's cry. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. He goes from a cry of desperate need, and now we hear this cry of confident joy. Not springing anxiously from deep-seated fear or for his own safety, but arising wonderfully from his delight and confidence in God's glory. The God who's above the heavens. The God whose glory will one day be over all the earth. David's enemies are still there. They're mentioned again in verse 6, hunting him, trying to trap him, but, but just look how it's turned upside down. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. And maybe that's already happened. Maybe David is speaking of what will yet happen. Either way, he's confident that God's purposes will prevail. It's only a matter of time. And so he sings, verse 7, My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. And then, quite beautifully, awake, my soul, awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. And normally, we'd be woken by the dawn, wouldn't we? That's the natural way of things. But in another turnabout, David is going to waken the dawn. He's not content with hiding quietly in his cave. He wants to sing. His heart is bursting with his joy in the Lord. If this was a, a movie, the music would start to build up now at this point, swelling to an emotional, joyful proclamation of praise. And he wants the whole world to join him in song. Verse 9, I will praise you, Lord. Among the nations, I will sing of you among the peoples. He wants the whole world to hear. He wants the whole world to know how great is God's love. There's an old Wesley hymn we, we don't sing so much these days, has the lines, Oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of his grace. The arms of love that compass me would all the world embrace. Well, those arms are certainly big enough. And so David has moved from have mercy on me, oh my God, to a song of joy. And David's song can be our song. It should be our song. 
because it is Jesus' song. Can you see how David foreshadows Jesus? Didn't Jesus suffer a similar experience? Crowds baying for his blood, soldiers cruelly mocking him, the flogging, the nails, the spear. So like David's enemies, the ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. And with regard to those enemies falling into a trap they themselves set, again, it's more than a hint at what was to come for Jesus. Satan thought he was going to be victorious over Jesus by using Judas Iscariot that Jesus should die on a cross. And of course, all he was doing was falling into his own trap. It's through the cross that Satan was defeated. Jesus was buried in a cave, but gloriously, he was raised to life. And David's prayer and song, O oh God above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. Well, it's echoed in Jesus' final command, recorded in Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus wants all people to the ends of the earth to join him in this song, to know of God's love and faithfulness. And one day, the Bible says the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. David sings with absolute conviction in his heart that it should be so. Absolute confidence that it will be so. And so this morning I ask you, do you have the same confidence? As you look around at this world, as you consider countries, probably the names of which we've barely heard of, the homes of millions of people who've never heard the gospel, who never think of Jesus, dots on the map with no connection, or when David arrived in this cave of Adullam, he was alone, composing this psalm in dark isolation, but we're told in uh, 1 Samuel 22, all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered round him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. It was a mixed crowd of misfits. Some of his family also joined him. And in a sense, they're kind of like a lovely picture of the church today. God's people, this motley crew of people gathered around our king. I wonder if David taught them this psalm he'd written. Would there have been harmonies that brought them together under God? Is it a psalm you can sing? I think Jesus would want us to make it our song. And that's our final heading, quite briefly. I, I know some people struggle to sing praises. Maybe you don't feel you have the same confidence to sing like David you might not feel your heart is steadfast enough. In fact, you might feel altogether too down and troubled right now to sing anything. But it's a song Jesus would have known and words that may have helped sustain him on the cross. And we can sing it with him. And that should give us confidence. It's like standing next to somebody in a, in a choir who sings really well. Uh, they sing loudly and boldly and it's kind of easy to sing along with them. Well, we can think of ourselves as singing this song with the Lord Jesus. These are words we can sing from our hearts. Because if we're a Christian like David, well, if we trust God like David, perhaps I should say, we've taken refuge in God. And he covers us now with his wings. And what a refuge we enjoy in his shadow. God has indeed sent from heaven to save us. He sent his love and faithfulness. He sent them in the person of Jesus. Jesus has come to save us and so fulfill his purpose for us, working sovereignly in all things for our good. And he brings the promise that having begun a good work in us, he'll carry it on to completion. He will fulfill his purposes in us and for us. This is our God. And whatever metaphorical ravenous beasts surround us at the moment, he is our refuge as a Christian. We can rest in him. 
But as we do so, our longing should be that others too might come to know that rest. The arms of love that comfort me would all mankind embrace. The folk that come into Thursday Cafe. The new face that turns up on a Sunday in church. The post worker. The window cleaner. The person walking a dog on Rose Isle Beach. Whoever it might be, all people need to know of this God, of his love and his faithfulness. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. That's to be our song. There's nothing more worth singing about, is there, than that? There's nothing more sure for us to sing of, that one day his glory will be over all the earth. And so, let's sing together now of that glory, joining in with the words of, to God be the glory, great things he has done. If you're able to stand as the music begins, let's join together. Do stay standing and uh, don't rush off after the prayer because Peter has one more item to, uh, to come in. But let me pray for us. Dear God, we thank you for bringing us together in one place to worship you today. We ask that you help us to stay consistently in your word each day that we might abide in you and you in us. Please help us to seek you and not to seek earthly things in times of need. Help us to keep our minds focused on you, and may we strive to do your will. Amen. Amen. I'll probably take a seat for a second. Well, folks, we won't detain you from your coffee for too long. Um,
apologies that many of us have come in quite late uh, to share good news. We've had uh, almost 100 folk in Elgin this morning, uh, lots of uh, children, families on the back of our holiday club. So praise God for that. And we also praise God for uh, the DePaula family, for Davi, Benjamin, and Emma. Um, uh, this is your last official Sunday with us. It's not the last time we'll see you. You're not going far. Um, why don't you come and join us, uh, you three? Um, I remember the Zoom call I had with a minister in Edinburgh uh, about four years ago now. And I was speaking to him about the, the, this process of having a minister in training and uh, how we might go about it. I also happen to know that he was involved in a trust fund that gave out money for that sort of thing. So I had an ulterior motive in speaking to him. And he said to me that day, I think we can, uh, we can help you to fund this, which was music to my ears. And then he said, and I think I've got a candidate for you as well. And uh, that turned out to be this young man. I used to be the young man around here. <laughs> and, uh, and then Davi arrived. Uh, three years here, three years of, uh, well, a growing family. Uh, three years of growing in uh, giftedness and in ministry experience. Um, Davi, as most of you will know, has accepted a call to be, it's Peter here, to be the assistant minister at Smithton uh, Church, so just along the road in Inverness, so we will uh, see you uh, again. On behalf of everyone, we want to say thank you for your friendship, uh, your service, and your partnership in uh, gospel ministry. Um, we will really miss you. I will really, really miss you. Um, we wanted to say thank you, and uh, so as it, we didn't keep it a secret very well, we asked the congregation if they'd like to give, to contribute to some gifts. And I have to say they, they gave and gave and just kept on giving, so <laughs> we were able to be quite generous. So thank you all. Um, I think that's a mark of the, uh, the, the, the love and respect in which you're, you're all held. Uh, so, without too much further ado... Um, Emma, your role is uh, just as important, if not more important, than, than Davy's. Um, your part, the, the part you've played in our church family has been uh, wonderful. And uh, so we have some things. Ruth <clears throat> has the first. There we go for you there. And um, we also have, um, I hope this is not a sexist gesture, giving this to, the, to the, the wife of a family. It's just that you've got better taste than him, Emma. Um, <laughs> But um, there's a card here and a gift which will hope, well, you can spend it on what you want, but hopefully it might be useful in uh, making your new house a home. So there you go. Um, Benjamin. Now, we've got a couple of things here. I won't get them all out. Some books, a lovely children's Bible, some bits and bobs. But, but for a young third-generation Brazilian lad carrying on Paul's footballing theme... <laughs> I thought, I thought we had this. <laughs> so, um, you'll, grow, you'll grow into it. That's fair. <laughs> there we go. So, some bits and bobs for you as well. Uh, now, Davi, um, one of our key roles, which I hope we've performed, at least to the best of our ability, is to help equip you for um, many, many years of uh, Bible-based ministry. Um, and uh, hopefully that's happened in lots of different ways. Uh, but this gift to you is designed to help you to keep on doing that. Just to explain to folks here, um, uh, Davi has, as well as his time here, he's been studying at uh, Edinburgh Theological Seminary, uh, part-time, sometimes traveling, sometimes online. And uh, there was a scheme at ETS um, a couple of years ago uh, which, where they hoped to be able to give every uh, student um, a, a package of Bible software called Logos. It's a brilliant, powerful uh, Bible uh, research, sermon building, preparation tool. I use it every day. Um, and they hoped to have a scheme where they could give that to each student at a kind of reduced rate. Unfor I don't know what happened. Unfortunately, the whole thing kind of collapsed and it never happened. Uh, so, Davi, here is, um, here is your ticket to Logos for the future as well. So, there you go. And then, not quite finally, penultimately, if that's a word, um, 
uh, here's a, you've got some cards, but here's another card, and I think maybe not everyone, but most folk in the church have been able to, um, don't eat the flowers, um, have been able to sign this as well, so some lovely messages there. Uh, we have one more thing as well, but before that, um, I thought I would pray. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us brothers and sisters, uh, partners in the gospel. Uh, we thank you for uh, Benjamin and for Davi and for Emma. Thank you for all the ways that you have uh, blessed us through them. Uh, please, we pray. Use them in your service and for your kingdom. Uh, we pray for the church family in Smithton. Uh, with so many people and so much going on, please, Lord, help them in their ministry there, that they might bless and encourage more people. Uh, we commit them to your care. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We can give them a round of applause. Should we do Let me just take... 30 seconds to say a big, big thank you to all of you. When Peter and I uh, put this date down as our last Sunday, that was because we weren't exactly sure when Emma and I would be moving. It turns out that that will hopefully happen on the 23rd. So you've got us for another couple of Sundays, though I won't be officially, the minister in training will be around. So it'll be lovely to see you all and make sure that we um, get some good chats before we go. And as we mentioned earlier, we're not going to be too far away. And um, when this guy goes on holiday, I'm sure I'll be around. So... <laughs> Don't you worry about that. I'm going on holiday next week. Are you free? <laughs> no, no. Um, thank you so much for these gifts. Listen, um, a training congregation needs to be willing to let the B team have a go. And you've certainly done that. You've been patient. You've been kind. You've been committed. You've been loving and faithful and caring toward myself. And Emma, giving us the opportunity to have this training experience and we have benefited from it immensely so thank you for all your care thank you for all your love and your patience as you've allowed me to stumble my way through the last three years in front of you all and uh, come and visit we'll be there an hour along the road and we'll certainly be back here so thank you very much i think there's some kind of cake is there don't spoil the surprise <laughs> Listen, that was an educated guess. I, I mean, Ab Abby's walking towards us with a large knife, so I, <laughs> I um, thank you. I hope there is. Um, we are blessed in our congregation to have many people with many gifts. In fact, it almost seems as if whatever we need, whatever we need to do, there seems to be someone who has the skill to do it. So uh, Mandy has made us a lovely cake. Thank you, Mandy. Please do uh, bring it up. Oh, and I've forgotten a present. We'll do that in a minute. Um, oh, wow. Super, look at that. Fantastic. You can come and get a look later on. <laughs> Here we go. Super. Thank you, Mandy. Um, who wants to cut the cake? Ben? You'll all get a piece. We'll slice it up. And finally, for the present that I forgot, Jamie, um, just to explain, this is, um, you've not got many hands left, but this is something to hang on your wall, which will uh, give you, I hope, fond memories of Burghead as a place. Uh -huh. And when people come around and they say, where's that? You can say, let me tell you about Burghead. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Folks, stick around. We will cut the cake. We'll have coffee and so on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.